Amen. Thank you. Well, um, it's lovely to be with you this morning um, on this lovely sunny day as well. It's brilliant. Um, we're continuing in our series on Ephesians this morning, um, which has been split into three sections chosen, which Phil kicked off for us at the start of our series, focusing on Ephesians chapter one, how God chose us before the creation of the world for his, the purpose of loving relationship with him and our adoption to sonship is all by his grace, not by our own works. Then we moved on to our change section of this series, which Chris kicked off for us so brilliantly last week, where he spoke about how the gospel has transformed us, how we were all dead in our sins, but now are made alive through Jesus. And this week, we are continuing in our change section of this series, and we're going to be looking at how the gospel, belief in Jesus, changes our citizenship. So let's start by delving straight into the passage. We're in Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 3, verse 6. So I'll just give you a chance to find that in your Bibles. And then um, it should come up on the screen as well behind me. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to you who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. So today's passage is going to focus on two main themes, what we were before Jesus and what we are now because of Jesus. This passage is all about reconciliation, about divisions being broken and made right, and about people's relationships being restored through Jesus Christ. The overarching story of the Bible is one of reconciliation and restoration to how things were intended to be. The Bible starts with God's creation of the world where he created all things and breathed the world in all its beauty and wonder into existence. He created humanity, male and female, created uniquely yet equally. He walked with his creation in the cool of the evening, sharing fellowship and friendship with his people. Then sin enters the world and brings division division between God and humanity, between humanity and creation, and between humanity and humanity. Yet God always intended to restore this broken relationship, and through Jesus, he creates one new humanity, 
and new people who are brought into unity and peace with one another through a shared love of Jesus and filling of his spirit. And this is the crux that this passage rests upon this morning. And we're going to be focusing on three main points. Number one, we are far from God. Number two, Jesus brings peace and unity. And number three, now we are living as citizens of a new kingdom. So number one, we were far from God. In these opening verses, Paul is addressing the Gentile believers and he is reminding them that before Jesus, access to God was through the Jewish nation. Gentiles were those who were not Jewish and circumcision was a symbol given by God to show that you were a part of the Jewish nation, that you belonged to the people of God. We today would be classed as Gentiles, those excluded from being citizens of Israel. And citizenship brings you access to all the benefits of being a part of a particular nation or kingdom. And the Jews were those that were counted as being a part of the promises of God. Whereas us Gentiles were outsiders of these promises as our citizenship was different. And we were, as verse 12 ends, without hope and without God in the world. And this brought huge division and separation amongst God's chosen people to those who were not Jewish. Access to God depended on being marked through circumcision as a Jew, following the Mosaic law, the law given to Moses by God, and teachings from the prophets from the word of God, through which the promise of Jesus was foretold and pointed to as a saviour who would rescue God's people from their sin. But the Gentiles were totally cut off from the citizenship ignorant of the commands of God and blinded to the promise of a saviour to rescue them. Even in the temple where God's presence dwelt, there was a wall of separation barring the Gentiles, non-Jews, from access within the temple, with signs warning them that if they were to dare to enter, they would be put to death. The Gentiles were totally cut off from having access to God. And Paul is reminding the Gentile Christian believers just how bleak their future was without Jesus. They were totally cut off, without hope and without God in the world. And this is still true of us today, that without belief and acceptance of Jesus, we are all without hope and without God in the world. We are all far from God. And then we who accept Jesus are brought near to him. There is no amount of good works, no amount of trying to earn our citizenship as children of God that will be able to rescue us or bring us the hope that Chris so brilliantly spoke on last week. You know, as he reminded us, we can do nothing to save ourselves. It's a gift of grace. And it's only through faith in Jesus that we are able to access God. For we were all spiritually dead before Jesus and without him. And now we are made spiritually alive with him. So number one, we were far from God. And now number two, Jesus brings peace and unity. For the Jews, the idea that the Gentiles were now included in the promises of God and had access to his presence was hugely contentious. They had earned their rights as a Jew. They were born into this faith. They had followed the laws and commands and they had access to the teachings of the prophets and to the word of God. Yet God is now establishing a new covenant with his people. For he made a way by which all people could be saved and have access to God through the death of his son, Jesus, on the cross. For even with access to God's law, offering sacrifices of atonement for their sin and the mark of circumcision, the Jews were unable to make themselves right with God and restore a close relationship with him as was known in the Garden of Eden. And in the temple, not only were there barriers separating the Jews from the Gentiles, but there were also barriers separating God's people from his presence. And deep within the temple was the most holy place where God's presence dwelled and only the high priest could enter this space once a year to offer a sacrifice on behalf of the people for their sins. Yet Hebrews 4 tells us how Jesus is now our great high priest who entered the holy of holies once and for all in our place 
and he bore the punishment of death on the cross that should have been ours so that we could no longer be separated from him but be brought near to him through his death on the cross and that promise. And he broke when he died on that cross and he rose again. That curtain temple, that curtain in the temple that separated God's people from his presence was torn in two from top to bottom as a sign that the barrier had been destroyed and now all people could have access to God's presence all of the time through his son, Jesus. And this new covenant put all people on an equal footing. There was no heritage, no history, no particular privilege, no certain ethnicity or upbringing that could count you as God's child. The message of the gospel is this, that all people, whatever their nationality, religion, education, language, social class or status, all people are far from God. And all people are brought near to God only through belief in Jesus. Jew or Gentile can only access God through belief in his son Jesus and acceptance of his death and resurrection, which broke the barrier of sin and made a way for us to be brought near to God. And Jesus made a way for all people to be united to him and for there to be peace instead of hostility and division. Let me just grab a drink. So, number one, we are far from God. Number two, Jesus brings peace and unity. And now number three, we have a new heavenly citizenship. We are made into one united people. Jew and non-Jew, together in peace and harmony through a shared love of Jesus. We are given a new citizenship. We are united together as one new people. Anyone who believes and has faith in Jesus is no longer an outsider, a foreigner or stranger, as this passage uses to define those who are not of the Jewish faith. Faith. We are fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. There are no requirements needed to have access to this new citizenship other than acceptance and belief in Jesus. We all have equal access through Jesus. And through Jesus, we get to share in all the promises of God. We are filled with the same Holy Spirit and we are all being built together to be a dwelling place for his presence. No longer does God's presence dwell separated behind a curtain of which only very specific access is granted. Through the Holy Spirit, God's presence now dwells within his people as we gather together like this, like this morning. His presence is able to be here with us. Think about just how outrageous that is, that the creator of the universe is now dwelling within us, his people. That we, won by Jesus, now carry the full presence of almighty God. No wonder the people in Ephesus needed to be reminded of this truth. What an incredible claim that where the people of the Old Testament had spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years traveling to a physical location to get a glimmer of God's glory and his presence. Now he dwells within us. And yet to be honest, the reality is, is that so often this truth can be lost on us today as well. How quick do we forget when we're going about our ordinary day lives, when we're interacting with those around us, when we're at home, when we're with our family, when we're on our own, when we're in our workplace, how quick do we forget that we have and we carry with us the fullness of the spirit and the presence of God? That he's not just near, he's not just close by, but he's within us. And the one who calls us to this radical, peace-filled unity is the same one who comes and makes our hearts his home. He himself is peace. He doesn't just tell us from afar to be be united, to be at peace. His peace and his unity are fully available within us. And this same presence, this same Holy Spirit is the one who points to the Son, Jesus, who points to the Father God, that the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit exist in perfect harmony and unity. And that through his Spirit, this is the unity and the peace that we are brought into together with one another. For he fills our hearts with a love for his church 
and a love for his people. Jesus is the chief cornerstone to this new building that God is establishing. The cornerstone is what holds the whole building together. It's the foundation for everything. And Jesus is the one who unites us, who holds us all together as we are being made into a dwelling place for his glory, for his power and for his love. And this new citizenship is so different to other citizenships in the world for there is a shared love and peace and unity that is impossible to be found elsewhere. For God's spirit is the one who unites us together and transforms us, that we get to share in a love of God who loves his people. The two are absolutely connected. And in John's gospel, chapter 17, verses 20 to 23, Jesus himself prays for this unity, for this new citizenship amongst the believers. And he prays this, he prays, I pray also for those who will believe in me. That's us here this morning, the ones that would go on to believe in him. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given me, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. What incredible truth. And what would it look like for us to be united as Jesus is united to his Father? It would be to have one will, to have one purpose, to have one direction and one love. You can imagine such a beauty about Jesus' oneness with his Father. Such a unity, such a love, so closely binded together that is absolutely unbreakable, that even death on the cross could not separate or could not divide the wonderful unity that is shared between Jesus and his Father. And that's the unity that we are being brought into this morning. This is the unity that's being prayed over us. This is it. This is the unity that we were created for. And when Jesus was praying this, he would have known that he was going to go to the cross and that he would break that divide that separates people from his presence, from being behind a curtain, but now totally available in us and that we would have his peace and his presence with us. And yet he still prays this prayer. And it shows that this is something that we have to keep coming to Jesus for and asking for his help. If Jesus, the one who made all of this possible, is praying, make them united, then how much more does this need to be at the forefront of our thinking and our praying? Lord, keep us united, keep us as one. It reminds me of an image of how ancient foot soldiers um, in armies would advance upon an enemy with their shields overhead and to their sides, protecting from all angles, walking in perfect unity as a strong unit. And as they walk in unison as one, they are able to approach something that might seem threatening or scary and break into that. And they are able to defend one another. And our purpose in the world isn't just to be united for loveliness' sake, like, oh, those lovely Christians that are all like smiley and happy. But no, it's a powerful truth that when we walk in this unity, we are able to take on the enemy, to take on the darkness, to break through the barriers in people's hearts and the barriers that separate people from God now. But a little bit of separation between a few soldiers in that formation And the whole thing falls apart and becomes weak. Why did Jesus pray this prayer? He knew that we would need it, that we would need to fight for this unity. He has made the way, but we have to keep coming to him and saying, Lord, keep us united, keep us as one. We only need to look at the global church and see the division and separation that exists between believers today. But imagine, just imagine if the global church was united, as this prayer says here, as the Father is united to the Son. If our church, if Freedom Church was united as the Father is to the Son. 
This church would be storming the world and people, as this passage says, would not be able to deny that there was a God through the powerful unity displayed, reflecting the powerful love and the unity of the Father and the Son. And as Jesus teaches us, people would undeniably know that there was a God and that he is love. For when we allow God's Spirit to join us in unity as the Father is united to the Son, His wonderful love is powerfully displayed. And this new citizenship that Paul talks about is so revolutionary, it's so beautiful, it's so counter the world that we all have equal access to unbelievable joy and love and power and hope and peace through the same Holy Spirit. That we are all completely equal daughters and sons of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's no hierarchy, hierarchy. There's no better, more deserving or less deserving Christian. We are one. There's no second class Christian in this new kingdom and this new citizenship. It's not like badges that we earn. We're like, oh, we've just believed in Jesus. So we earn our like badge of like, badge of, like I've been saved. Or like and then a couple of years later, oh, now I can pray out loud. So I earn my ba- prayer badge. Or like a couple of years later, now I've read the whole Bible. So I earn my like Bible reading badge. And then now I understand some of the context and some of the like history. So now I earn like super Bible reading badge. Like it's not like that. In God's kingdom, it's not, there's no escalation for we are as equal to someone who has just come to faith as we are to somebody who has been walking faithfully with the Lord for 70 or 80 years because this is the radical equality and love and unity that we are brought into as the people of God through Jesus. For example, like two Christian leaders that I've been personally influenced by in my faith or um, a man called Nicky Gumbel, who helped establish the Alpha Course, so a means of sharing the gospel with loads of people all over the world. And um, Tim Keller, who sadly went to be with the Lord very recently, but has written so many fantastic books about faith in Jesus. And I may look at my life and I may think, oh, well, I haven't even written one book, like let alone like loads, I mean, Chloe and your step ahead of me, but, you know. Um, and I might think, well, I haven't created a means of sharing the gospel with like, millions of people all over the world and I may start to count myself as less significant or less worthy of a Christian compared to them and yet the radical amazing truth of this gospel is that somehow by the grace and mercy of Jesus is that I am as equal in God's sight to them as Tim Keller or Nicky Gumbel or Phil the Blanken of whoever that may be in your life And perhaps this is a feeling that you can relate to. Maybe there are others whose lives we look at and we feel like less deserving or less worthy of a Christian when we compare ourselves to them. But this is not how this kingdom works. For it is never about what we do as we've been reminded of through Phil and through Chris earlier. It is completely a gift of grace that we get to choose to accept It's a result of God's mercy that he should love and save sinners like the lot of us. That we are all viewed completely equally in God's sight. We all start off in exactly the same place, whether we've been born into a Christian home and been going to church all our lives or whether we've only just heard about this Jesus. Whatever our nationality, whatever our race, whatever our language, our education, our social status, our culture, our worldviews, we are all far from God. Without hope in the world, then Jesus. And he's the one who makes a way by which we can be brought near to God. When we believe in him, we all become a part of this new people, citizens of his heavenly kingdom. And this kingdom is one of justice, of equality, of goodness, of peace and unity beyond our understanding of which every single person in this room, if we have professed a belief in Jesus, has complete equal access to, which every single Christian all over the world has complete equal access to. For Jesus is building his global church. 
a new humanity that are wonderfully united to him and to each other, just as he is united to the Father in a way that cannot be explained or understood outside of the saving work of Jesus. And yet, this can be so hard for us to grasp and fully understand. It can be so challenging to live in the reality of this peace and this unity that Jesus has won for us. We can comprehend being united about something. For example, we might be united over supporting a football team or we might be united about a shared new vision that has been introduced at work. And I just thought I'd pause here and just say, yeah, that is evident because I'm staying loyal to my roots and thought I'd honour Chris Butland as well while he's on sabbatical and get a bit of Everton still here on Sunday morning. Um, but however, you know, we know what it is to be united, to be united. But in these situations, we will rarely see ourselves as equals to those around us in those situations. For example, supporting the football team. I mean, I don't even really watch it that much. I definitely wouldn't think myself as equal to the players on the pitch or the coach that has led and trained that football team. Or we might share and totally agree with this new vision that our workplace is introducing, but we're unlikely to see ourselves as equal to the head teacher or CEO or manager of the place of work. Yet in Jesus' kingdom, as the new body, the new people that he is making us into, we have complete equal standing with one another. We are one body, one people, one temple, one family, all of which Jesus and only him, our risen saviour, is head and above. We are totally, utterly equal in God's sight and therefore we should view one another as totally equal brothers and sisters who have been brought in by Jesus to this wonderful new kingdom as citizens of his. Why does Paul need to remind the Ephesians of this? Why do we need reminding of this? Because we all too quickly and too easily put back up divisions that Jesus has totally abolished once and for all. We compare ourselves either more favourably or less favourably to others. We discredit ourselves from the wonders of the fullness of life which Jesus offers us as this new humanity. We cut ourselves off from others. We fall out with each other. We get caught up over our differences. And the enemy is all too keen to join in in seeking and helping with ways to, for us to be separated and divided. For when we are united, as Jesus prays for us in John, God's love is powerfully displayed and powerfully at work in the world. But the wonderful message of this truth, this gospel of Jesus, is that he has totally done away with all dividing walls that would separate his people from his presence. And he has made a way by which we can know peace with God and with one another through the equipping help of the Holy Spirit. We are, as Paul commands in Romans 12, to allow the Holy Spirit and the word of God to continue to transform and renew our minds, our thinking towards one another and are thinking of ourselves so that we would not conform to the old patterns of thinking in the world. In Philippians 4 verse 8, there is a practical command that can help us when we feel division creeping in. For we are commanded to focus our minds on whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We are to focus our minds on not what divides us, not our differences, but on what unites us, Jesus and his awesome love and mercy. Jesus brought about the impossible by making a way that we can know him closely and be the new temple where his presence dwells. But he also makes it, brings about the impossible by making a united people who all look and sound different who will have different cultures and upbringings, yet who all share 
in a united and equal new citizenship as brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the risen Lord Jesus. So it'd be great if we could just spend some time this morning just being reminded of some of that truth from God's word, that we've been reminded that his presence is not far off now, but it's with us, is here amongst us this morning, just like we have sensed it already. And it would be great if we could just take some time to reflect, do I truly believe that I am an equal son or daughter to Jesus? Do I truly see myself as God sees myself and not as the world would say? And it's a brilliant opportunity as well just to think and to bring this to God and say, is there divisions and separations that I've put back up that Jesus has abolished between me and God or between a brother or sister gathered here this morning or in our lives? And the wonderful truth is that Jesus says he's with us and he helps us to be united where we can't do it in our own strength. He sent his spirit and his presence to enable us to, through his working, be united and one, just as the Father is united to the Son. And when we get a hold of that, his wonderful love, his wonderful mercy, his wonderful truth and kindness is so powerfully showed to the world around us.